Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tiveri from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different aspects of the uh, recombinant DNA technology. So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the host, we have discussed about the vectors and in the previous uh, lectures, we have also discussed about the different types of enzyme what you are going to use to produce the recombinant DNA technology. During that discussion, we discuss about the recession enzymes, we discuss about the DNA polymerases, we discuss about the alkaline phosphatases and we have also discussed about the ligases. And uh, there are many more enzymes which are also been required, but that is not part of the gene cloning. So, we have not discussed those enzymes and the uh, other accessory components which are required for the uh, gene cloning. Now, once you have produced the particular uh, gene fragment or the recombinant DNA, then the next task would be that you are actually going to deliver this DNA into the host. And the delivery of the host, uh, delivery of the DNA into the host uh, requires the precise mechanisms and the precise process through which you can be able to uh, deliver the DNA into the host. So, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about how you can be able to deliver the DNA into the host and remember that it, uh, the, all the methods what we are discussing is also going to be specific for the host, uh, uh, host uh, cells and uh, because uh, uh, it, it depends which cell type you are going to deliver the DNA. So, uh, we have discussed about the whole process of the recombinant DNA technology, we have discussed how we can be able to generate a recombinant DNA and, uh, and, uh, and the next step would be that you are going to deliver the DNA into the host. If you are want to deliver the DNA into the host, you have to understand the uh, two properties of uh, two different properties. Once you have to understand the uh, properties of the host cells and then you also have to understand about the property of the uh, recombinant DNA. Now, what you see here is that when you talk about the DNA delivery in the host, as I said in the past also the host could be of prokaryotic in origin or host could be uh, eukaryotic in origin right and remember that there are significant difference between the eukaryotic and the prokaryotic organisms. Within the prokaryotic organisms, we have discussed about the E. coli and the bacillus subtilis as a host, whereas within the eukaryotes, we have discussed about the yeast, we have discussed about the uh, insect cell lines and we have also discussed about the mammalian cells. Okay? And uh, it is very important that you should first understand the host which host you are going to deliver the DNA because the host, the surface chemistry of the host is either going to attract or the repel the DNA as a result of the opposite or the similar charges. So, it is very important that when you understand the host uh, surface chemistry of the host, the host cell membrane could be positively charged or it could be negatively charged. If it is positively charged, it is going to attract the DNA because DNA is negatively charged, right? So, it is going to attract the DNA. In other cases, if the host cell membrane is negatively charged, it is actually going to repel the negative charges. Uh, presence of the cell wall, which is mostly in the case of the uh, prokaryotic case, uh, prokaryotic host cells such as bacteria or the uh, yes, uh, or bacteria or the plant cells such as in the case of bacteria, fungus and plants causes additional physical barrier to the uptake and the entry of the uh, entry of the whole cell. Apart from that, the recombinant DNA is not going to be different in terms of their surface chemistry. Majority of the DNA is going to have the negative charge on their cell surface on their surface. And uh, you have to devise a strategy so that the host cells are going to take up this DNA and they are actually going to get 
transformed okay so what is mean by the transformations okay what is mean by the dna debris so one of the method is transformation right and uh, at the donor site when you want to make the donor cells uh, you know so that it will take up the dna those cells are also called as the competent cells okay competent cells means the cells which are going to take up the dna in their uh, inside their uh, cell body so when you want to do the dna debris in host you have to work on to the surface chemistry of the host and then you also going to work on to the surface chemistry of the uh, on the recombinant dna surface chemistry of the recombinant dna will remain constant irrespective of whether you are making a recombinant dna for the plant animal or virus or bacteria whereas the surface chemistry of the host will actually vary it is going to be uh, negatively charged or the positively charged and in all of uh, in either of these cases it is actually either going to repel the dna or the attract the dna apart from that the cell wall also have to take care of the cell wall so that you, the cell wall should not create the additional physical barrier and you can actually have the uh, device detached so that you can be able to remove the cell wall or you can make the cell wall as porous or something all those kind of strategies all these uh, treatment what you are going to do for the host cell so that the host cell can be able to take up the dna efficiently is called as the competent cells and this process is going to be used for making a cell readily taking up the uh, dna now what is uh, so one of the method of the dna dna delivery into the host is called as transformations right and this is mostly being used in the case of the prokaryotic cell and why there is a why there is a uh, need to uh, transform the bacteria or why, how the naturally the transformation is uh, you know deliv uh, delivering the dna into the different different bacteria is coming from a very very uh, old uh, approach that you know that if there is a there is a resistance in one bacteria right the resistant bacteria is spreading that resistance into a colony of bacteria with the help of a process which is called as transformations so how it happens it happens that you are actually going to have the donor cells right so you are going to have a donor cell and you are actually going to have the acceptor cells so now you see here is that the donor cell is resistant whereas the acceptor cells are not resistant right it is actually going to be sensitive at the beginning but what will happen is that the donor cell is actually going to throw its dna so it is actually going to throw the plasmid it's actually going to throw the plasmid which is going to harbor the this particular resistance against a particular bacteria a particular antibiotic for example it could be for anything actually it can be a resistance against the any kind of environmental stress it could be a resistance against the any kind of adverse situations and so on so imagine that we are talking about the ampicillin resistance for example right so ampicillin is an antibiotic right so bacteria will actually going to acquire a plasmid which will have the antibiotic resistance gene now what will happen is this particular bacteria which is a donor cell is actually going to throw this plasmid into the uh, environment right and then this uh, recombinant dna or i will say this plasmid is going to be taken up by the acceptor cell and as a, as a result of this this the the acceptor cell which was sensitive in the beginning is now going to be turned into resistance and that's how the uh, the antibiotic resistance is, is spreading across uh, the across the uh, a, a bacterial colony and that's why it is recommended that you should destroy the resistant bacteria when you are disposing these bacteria into the environment okay so it is a very very uh, advisable when you are working with the resistant bacteria you will actually going to destroy the dna now how the people have discovered the concept of transformations so people have discovered the concept of transformations by the experiment which is which uh, or the classical experiment which is done by the uh, griffith so what the griffith is doing is it is uh, he has taken the two different types of bacteria uh, one is called uh, of the strain like streptococcus pneumonia so he has taken two strain one is virulent strain which actually or the s strain 
which actually causes the disease and the death of the mice whereas the avulent strain or the R strain which is incapable of causing the disease or the death of the mice. So, he has taken the two strain one is S the other one is R. S actually can cause the death of the uh, mice whereas R is not been able to kill the death. Okay. So, what he has done is he has done the experiment in uh, four different conditions and these experiments he has done in the year of 1928 and that is how he has discovered the concept of transformations. So, what will happen is that in the first case what he has done is the, the mice were injected with the virulent S strain. So, as soon as the mice were injected with the virulent strain the mice is actually going to die because these mice are going to develop the disease and that is how they will actually going to die. In the second case he has actually heat killed the virulent strain. So, he has actually killed the bacteria right. Now, he has killed the bacteria, but he has so when he killed the bacteria uh, the he has destroyed the, uh, the uh, you know the living bacteria. So, virulent strain is heat killed and mice injected with it do not die. So, when he injected those heat killed bacteria to the uh, to the mice, the mice did not develop the disease and that is how he was survived. Then what he has done? He has actually taken the third stage and where he has actually injected the live uh, R strain actually and R strain remember that the R strain is uh, not causing a disease right. So, he has injected the non virulent R strain right. So, when he injected the non virulent uh, uh, R strain the mice did not uh, you know did not develop a disease and he has survived. Then in the fourth setup what he has done is he has done a mixture of things right. What he has done is he has taken the non virulent strain he has injected those and uh, so he has taken the non virulent strain and then he mixed that with a heat killed uh, uh, virulent strain ok. So, he has taken the uh, heat killed S, uh, S strain and he has taken the uh, uh, R strain as non virulent strain. So, he has taken the uh, R strain he has mixed that with the heat killed uh, S strain ok and he has injected that mixture into the mice ok. Now, what will happen when he has done that mice actually died. Why he had died? Because the R strain the DNA was present from this heat killed bacteria but DNA cannot get into or express any cells and that is why it, the when you are uh, you know when you are uh, injecting the mice to the heat killed uh, uh, virulent strain they were not getting the any kind of disease because the DNA what were present inside this cannot be uh, propagate and cannot express the genes which are required for the causing the death uh, causing the disease. Whereas, in this case what will happen is that when he has taken this the DNA uh, came out from the uh, he, from the heat killed uh, S strain and it has been taken up by the R strain and that is how the R strain got converted into the S strain and then this S strain is actually infecting the mice and it is causing the disease and that is how the mice is dying. So, this actually proves that when you inj when you inject the mice with a non virulent strain and the heat killed virulent strain they die. Type 2 bacteria wrapped in type 3 capsule are recovered from these mice. So, when they recovered the bacteria from this mice they could not find the R strain they find the S strain which actually proves that there is a there is a uh, there is a factor which is present in the S strain and that can be used or that is being uh, utilized by the R strain and that is how the R strain be, is being converted into the S strain. So, this uh, this uh, conversion of R into S is being called as transformation right this means you are changing yourself right. So, that is being called as transformation and how that happens that happens because the heat killed S strain the heat killed S strain has given up the DNA and this DNA is being taken up by the R strain and that R strain will get converted into the virulent S strain and that is how it is actually causes the death of the, the mice. So, this whole concept of transformation is being discovered 
by the Frederick Griffith in a, its classical experiment in the year of 1928. And that has opened up or uh, is simple you know it, that has opened up to, uh, many avenues. So, people have understand that okay, now how uh, we can be able to deliver the DNA into a you know into a into a related species uh, cell and that is how I can be able to in, uh, bring the good qualities of the particular species and so on. Now, how that happens? So, what will be the mechanism of transformation? So, mechanism of transformation is that transformation is the process by which the cell free DNA is taken by another bacteria. The DNA from the donor bacteria binds to the competent recipient cell and DNA enters into the cell. The DNA enters into the recipient cell through a uncharacterized mechanisms. The DNA is integrated into the chromosomal DNA through a homologous recombinations. Uh, naturally, transformation is a common uh, between the closely related species only. So, what will happen is that you have a donor cell and the donor cell is going to give up the DNA. It could be a plasmid, it could be a recombinant DNA and so that and the extraction of the donor cell fragment after lysis by the chemical or the mechanical mean. Then what will happen is that there will be a damage. So, one strand of the donor DNA is going to be integrated after binding into the cell membrane and then the it is going to enter into the cell right. So, this is a competent, competent recipient cells. What is mean by competent is that it is being treated in such a way so that it is actually going to be taken up the DNA and then it will actually go and do a uh, you know homologous recombination into the chromosomal DNA and it is actually going to be integrated and that is how you are going to have the uh, transformed cells and you are going to have the plain cells. So, this is just uh, the simple mechanism through which the people have explained that how the DNA is being taken up by the uh, competent uh, cells and that is how it is actually going to transform a particular bacteria with a additional traits or it is going to be transformed with the recombinant DNA to uh, uh, to add on the uh, uh, the, the uh, recipient or the traits additional traits. So, there are many uh, mechanism through which you can be able to generate the competent cells of a bacterial cells. So, these are I have to I have taken an different bacteria for example, the streptococcus pneumoniae you are actually going to treat the bacteria with mitomycin C or fluoroquinol. Then in the bacillus subtilis you can actually expose the bacteria with UV light and that is actually going to uh, you know uh, create the uh, competence. Then in the case of helicobacter pylori the bacteria which actually causes the ulcer uh, that also uh, can uh, you know can be used uh, for the different types of transformation experiments and helicobacter pylori can be the competent cells of the helicobacter pylori can be prepared by treating the bacteria with the uh, antibiotic called ciprofloxacin. Then we have lignolia pneumonipsilla which you can use the, so many of these uh, agents like mitomycin, norfoxacin, orfloxacin, nekledexin all these you know. And then you also have the E. coli. So, for the E. coli you can use the e. Co uh, uh, calcium chloride or the rubidium chloride as the transformation as for, for the making the competences. Now, the question comes how you can be able to make the competences. So, I have taken an example simple example of E. coli where how you can be able to use the e. coli, uh, you know, calcium chloride as the competences uh, to make the competences. So, preparation of the competences. The bacteria is incubated with a divalent cation for example, the calcium chloride or manganese chloride or the rubidium chloride for 30 minutes at 4 degrees Celsius. During this process, the cell wall of the treated bacteria is swelled and it gather the factor required for the intake of the bacteria dogged onto the plasma membrane. Uh, now, what will happen is that when you are going to make the competent cells, they are going to be fragile, they are going to be uh, you know very very delicate because you are actually going to swell the you know bacterial cell wall actually and and you are doing so because you are activating the machinery in such a way that it is going to be taken up the DNA. So, that is why if it is a very very fragile you are actually going to use the proper storage conditions then only uh, the bacteria is going to take up the DNA and will survive later on otherwise it is not going to survive. So, because they are fragile you are going to use the centrifugation speeds very very you know uh, slow speed centrifugation you are supposed to do so that 
and you are also going to do the pipetting very nicely so that they should not experience any kind of shear stress right uh, i'm sure you will not understand what is mean by the shear stress but uh, shear stress means uh, suppose you know two layers of you know two layers of uh, water if you are actually you know have you experienced when you are going to river actually for example so rivers uh, you know waves are hitting you right so you might be experiencing some kind of waves going into your body actually so that is a shear stress where you one layer is actually rubbing the other layer and that's how the because of this rubbing it is actually going to damage the any particle which is present in this right it is actually going so for example if this is a particle right and it has been run by two different layers then it is actually going to create a pressure difference and because of this pressure difference this molecule is can be broken down and this is a one of the one of the uh, classical way in which you can be able to uh, you know you can be able to broken the cells and that's how you can be able to recover the plant, uh, protein material that anyway we are not discussing so because of these problems it has to be stored at a very very you know uh, material so that it has to be stored in a 15 to 20 percent glycerol and it has to be stored at minus 80 degrees celsius so that you can be able to use them for very very long time remember that these treated bacteria are actually very very fragile because of the uh, weaky leaky cell walls actually and they are actually going to have the some kind of you know emergency kind of situation is going to be created into into the bacteria so that bacteria will take up the dna whatever is the bacteria is whatever the dna is going to be provided into the solution and actually cell wall is also broken so it's going to have the pores onto the cell wall and that pore is going to be used by the dna to enter okay and uh, when you want to make the competent cells uh, you are actually going to use the um, uh, you know you are also going to use the uh, the log phase bacteria so you are actually going to use the log phase bacteria so if you see the bacterial cell wall um, growth what you see here is that this is actually being called as lag phase in which the growth is not uh, very fast right? so and bacteria is adjusting to the new environment whereas in the log phase it is actually going to be called as exponential growth phase where the every bacteria is dividing and multiplying at a very very fast rate and then you are also going to have the stationary phase where the number of death is going to be equal to the number of the new uh, uh, new uh, growth right so the uh, the birth is actually going to be uh, equal to the death phase and then this phase this is the decline phase or the death phase where you the number of death is going to be bigger than the number of new birth right and this will happen when there will be a shortage of the uh, nutrition and this will happen when there are uh, there will be no uh, new supply of nutrition so the uh, whatever the nutrition is available within the culture media is going to be utilized by so death of the older uh, bacteria is going to provide the nutrition for the growth of the new bacteria now we have to use the log phase bacteria so that they are uh, log phase bacteria are very very active so their metabolism is active and that's how you are going to use the log phase bacteria so the growth stage of a bacteria has a significant impact for its ability to take up the foreign dna the bacteria at log phase is more active and efficient to perform the dna damage and repair than the stationary phase as a result it is preferred to use the bacteria of a log phase for making the competent cells for the transformations now these are the uh, some of the steps what you are going to use for the uh, for the making the competent cells and then you are going to do the transformations so uh, on the day of transformations uh, the competent cells are being incubated with the dna or the circular plasmid containing appropriate resistant genes such as mp synthesis gene for 30 minutes on to the room temperature so the, what you are going to do is you are going to uh, take the uh, you know competent cells you are going to put it into the bucket right ice bucket and then you are going to add the sufficient quantity of this plasmid which contains the appropriate resistance so for example in this case we have taken an example of the ampicillin 
then uh, you are going to uh, do the heat shock treatment. So, you are going to actually increase the temperature of the bacteria for a very, very short duration of the time. So, that it is actually going to cause a heat shock and the heat shock is a kind of a where you the cell is actually going to expand right. So, this is going to be like small pore right. When you give the heat shock it is actually going to cause right there will be a uh, you know the movement of the molecule on both the ends right because you know that when you provide the heat into the system it always allows the expansion of the sample right. So, the bacterial cell which is very small is actually going to expand for a very small period of time and how they will expand it is actually going to keep the lipid molecules on a on a distance right and because it is going to keep the liquid molecule on the distance it is going to allow the entry of the DNA what is present into the environment ok. And once you are the heat shock is done then you are actually going to bring this bacteria uh, again to the normal temperature. So, that all these uh, oh, uh, all these gaps what is being created are also going to be closed. So, the computer cells are given a brief heat shock for example, the 42 degree Celsius for 90 seconds to relax the cell wall and high temperature stress causes the upregulation of the factor responsible for DNA recombination and the repair. So, this heat shock when you do it is actually going to create the expansion of the cell, it is going to create the pores so, and then after this you are going to bring it back to the normal temperature. So, that it is going to shield the gaps and because you have increased the temperature it is also going to activate the factors which are responsible for the uh, DNA recombinations and the DNA repair damages because that is the kind of the training what is present or what is the that is the way the bacterial cells are being trained right. And because they were actually going to upregulate the factor responsible for DNA recombination and repair, the DNA what is being present is actually going to recombine with the chromosomal DNA and that is how it is going to integrate into the genome. Then after this uh, chilled media is going to be added for the faster recovery of the, the transformed cells right. And then you are actually going to spread this solutions. Uh, so, you are going to spread this solution onto a agar plate containing the ampicillin right. So, it is plated onto the solid media with the appropriate antibiotics such as ampicillin and allowed to grow for another 18 to 24 hours right. Once you do that it you are going to see the colonies ok. So, you are going to see the colonies next day. So, transformed cells with the appropriate resistance will grow and give the colonies. Now, how many number of colonies you will get that is actually going to give you the additional information that was called as transformation efficiency. So, when you are going to make the competent cells, how you know that whether the competent cells what you have prepared is good in taking up the DNA or not. So, in that case you can be able to calculate the transformation efficiency. I have taken an example of the transformation right. So, you can see that once you do the transformations you are going to see the this kind of pattern right. So, this is a plain bacteria which does not contain any kind of resistance. So, if I plate the plain bacteria onto a ampicillin resistance plate you will not get the colonies right. Whereas, the same bacteria when it is been transformed with a recombinant DNA. So, in this case this is a recombinant DNA from my lab what you see here and this this one actually is having a uh, ampicillin resistance right. Uh, what you see here is that you are going to get a bacterial colony right and how many number of colonies we are getting 80 to 90. So, you can actually plate uh, keep this plate into a colony counter and uh, the colony counter is actually going to tell you the number of colonies ok. So, this is a n colony. So, how you can be able to calculate the transformation efficiency. So, 80 to 90 colonies right. So, number of colony forming unit obtained by transforming 1 microgram of plasmid into the given volume of the competent cells. So, the number of colonies which are going to get by transforming 1 microgram of DNA is going to be called as transformation efficiency ok. Let us see how you can be able to calculate this. For example, if you transformed 1 microliter of 0 0.01 nanograms per microliter plasmid into a 100 microliter of the competent cells, you add 900, 900 microliter of LB medium into the cell to get a total volume of 
1000 microliter and then you plated the 100 microliter of the transformation which means you have loaded only the one tenth of the uh, total uh, transformation rate mixtures. Now, if the plate has 450 colonies on to the next day which means you got 450 colonies when you are loading the one tenth of the bacteria and how much DNA is present in this one tenth 0 0.01 nanograms ok. So, this point and you are adding the one microliter. So, it means you are actually getting so, if you are getting the uh, number of colonies with one tenth at 450, then this means you are supposed to get 4500 colonies if you load the one microliter of 0 0.01 uh, nanogram DNA. If you are getting this much from the 0 0.01 nanogram, what will be the con amount you are going to get with the one microgram? That will be you multiply this number right you multiply this by the 1 microgram. So, this is what I have done it. So, na nanograms of DNA plate calculation would be the 1 microliter of 0.09 into 100 microliter divided by 100 microliter. So, that will be 0 0.001 nanogram DNA which giving you 450 colonies. So, for the efficient calculations 450 into 0 0.001 divided by 1000 nanogram which is 1 microgram actually and that will give you the transformation efficiency of 4.5 into 10 to power 8 as the transformation efficiency. This means, if you if you transform 1 microgram of DNA right, it is going to give you the 4.5 into 10 to power 8 colonies ok. Although nobody is transforming the 1 microgram of DNA because that 1 microgram DNA is a very very big number actually. But uh, so, this is a very good efficiency actually. So, any number which is above 10 to power 7 is a going to be considered as uh, good efficiency. Now, this is a chemi chemical method in which you can be able to do the transformation. The same can be done with the other method or the other methods. Remember that in the in the chemical method also what we are doing we are actually treating the, uh, uh, the cells with the divalent cation and these divalent cations are relaxing the cell wall in or the cell membrane in such a way that it is actually going to make them more porous and that can be achieved with the other physical factors. So, one of such factor is called as electroporations. So, plasma membrane is composed of lipid and protein. These macromolecules gives a partial conductance to the cell membrane. When a high voltage pulse is given to the cell, the charge runs across the membrane and partially disturb the arrangement of the lipid molecule. As a result, it makes the formation of pores and allow the easy passage of the macromolecule, especially the charge molecule like the DNA. After the electroporation cell is allowed to recover from the damage and it forms the colonies onto the selective media. So, this is what exactly is happening. You are actually having the good packaging of the cell lipid molecules right and you are also having the uh, accessory proteins and all that. So, when you apply the, uh, the current right, when you apply the current across this uh, plasma membrane, what will happen is that lipid molecules are actually going to get away right they will be actually going and they will actually going to make a space for the DNA which is present outside will be enter into the cell and then after this you are actually going to remove the cell wall and that is how you are actually going to close the door right close this gap. So, this again the lipid molecule will come back and that is how you are going to do the electroporation. So, electroporation is a widely used technique for introducing the nucleic acid and other molecule into cell by applying electric field to the permalize the cell membrane temporarily. Uh, this method is effective for various cell type including bacteria, yeast, plant and mammalian cells. Electroporation involves applying a high voltage electric pulse to the cell suspension in an appropriate buffer. In this method, the transient micropores are created onto the membrane of the host cells allowing the molecule by like DNA or RNA enter into the cell. Once the electric field is removed, the cell membrane resealed trapping the introduced molecule inside the cell. So, this is what exactly happens right. You have a cell membrane before pulse. Once you apply the pulse, you are actually going to do the reorientation of the 
uh, on, onto the uh, lipids what is present onto the cell membrane and because of this the, the, the DNA molecule are going to enter and then after this you are actually going to once you apply, uh, remove the uh, pulse it is going to reseal or rearrange right and that is how the, these DNA molecules are going to be entrapped inside the cell. So, grow the cells to the appropriate phase of the bacteria which means the log phase, harvest the cells in ice cold electroporation competent bacteria to remove any growth media and then uh, prepare the DNA and RNA solution in a suitable buffer. The concentration of the purity of the nucleic acid can affect the electroporation efficiency and uh, mix the cells with the DNA RNA solution. Typically 1 to 10 microgram of DNA is used for the electroporator reactions. Then you are going to do the electroporations. So, transfer the cell uh, DNA matrix mix to the electroporation cuvette, place the cuvette in the electroporator and apply the electric pulse. The parameters uh, may vary depending upon the cell type and gap width of the cuvette. Typical parameter for bacterial cells are 1.8 to 2.5 kV for 1.1 to 2 mm cuvette gap while mammalian cells require lower voltage and longer pulse durations. Then you have to do the recovery. So, immediately add a suitable recovery media to the cuvette to help the cells recover from the electric pulse. Transfer the cells to a new container and incubate under optimal growth condition for a specified period. Then you are going to do the selection and the screening. So, plate the cells on a selective media for example, the antibiotic containing agar plate or perform the other appropriate selection media methods to identify the successfully transformed cells. Now, there are methods, there are factors which are going to affect the transformation efficiency. So, one is that you are going to have the plasmid size, then you are also going to have the form of DNA. So, the supercoiled DNA, uh, remember that when we were discussing about the plasmid, we have said that the plas plasmid is going to be present in three different forms, open circle DNA, uh, nick DNA and the circular supercoiled DNA. So, supercoiled DNA actually gives the highest efficiency uh, for the transformations. Then the genotype of the cells, the cloning uh, strains for example, E. coli K12 strain have 4 to 5 times higher uh, transformation efficiency uh, of the similar strain without. For example, linear DNA which is poorly transformed in E. coli, the REC BC or REC D mutation can significantly improve the efficiency of these transformations. Then growth of the cells, so log phase bacteria is good for the higher transformation efficiency. Then methods of transformations and the damage of the DNA like for example, exposure of DNA to the UV radiation and all that is also going to affect the transformations. Now, this is all about the prokaryotic system, right. We have not discussed about the, uh, the uh, sub bacillus subtilis, but we, the methods remain the same. Uh, only the difference is that you are going to use the uh, different reagents for making the competent cells. Now, let us move on to the eukaryotic system. So, we have just taken the first the uh, simple eukaryotic system that is the yeast right. So, in the yeast you have the multiple method. One method first method is the lithium acetate uh, DNA uh, single standard DNA PEG method. So, in this method the yeast cells are incubated with a transformation mixture of the lithium acetate the PEG 3500 single standard carrier DNA and the foreign plasmid at 42 degrees Celsius for 40 minutes. The purpose of adding a carrier DNA is to block the non-specific site on the cell wall and made the plasmid available for uptake. Post transformation, the cells are pelleted to remove the transformation mixture and resuspend in 1 ml buffer. It is plated onto solid media with the appropriate selection pressure such as antibiotic. Then we also have another method which is called as the spheroplast transformation method. So, in this method the yeast cell wall is removed partially to produce the spheroplast. So, spheroplast means where you are actually going to remove the cell wall partially. So, it is actually going to have the broken cell wall and that is being called as the spheroplast. This is the spheroplast. Okay. So, uh, Spheroplasts are very fragile for the osmotic shock, but are competent to take up the field DNA at a high rate. In addition, the poly peg is used to facilitate the deposition of the plasmid and the carrier DNA on the cell wall for the easier uptake. So, these are the methods for making the spheroplast and then you are going to use that for transformations. So, in this method, first you are going to generate the spheroplast. How you are going to generate the spheroplast? 
these uh, yeast cells are incubated with an enzyme which is called as zymolase to partially remove the cell wall to produce the spirioplast. So, when you treat, so you first you grow the cells, right? You bring it to the lock phase and then you are going to use that for and treat it with the zymolase uh, enzyme. So, zymolase is actually going to treat onto the uh, cell wall and that is why it is actually going to remove the some components and that is why it is going to make the cell wall uh, porous and it is going to make the broken cell wall and this broken cell wall containing each cell is called as spirioplast and stereoplast can be very good in terms of taking up the DNA and uh, they are also good in uh, but they are fragile because they since you have opened removed the cell wall they can actually be very very sensitive for the osmotic lysis right. They are very uh, sensitive for the osmotic shock or the osmotic lysis. So, in the first step you are going to treat the cells with the zymolase to generate the spheroplast. In the second step you are they are going to be collected by centrifugation and incubated with the carrier DNA and the plasmid DNA for 10 minutes at room temperature. So, then you are going to incubate this with the DNA for 10 minutes at room temperature and then you are going to uh, so, you are going to uh, you know incubate that with the peg and the carrier DNA and the plasmid at room temperature for 10 minutes in an incubator. Then in the third step, uh, it is now treated with the peg and the calcium for 10 minutes with a gentle shaking. So, transformed uh, spirioplasts are plated onto the selected solid media incubated on 30 degrees Celsius for 4 days. So, once the, the, the transformation is being done then it is going to be plated onto a selective media which contains the antibiotic or any other kind of selection pressure and that is how it is actually going to be uh, and then you keep it in the for 4 days at 30, uh, 30 degrees Celsius because that is the optimal temperature for the yeast growth and then ulti ultimately what you are going to see is you are going to see the colonies and then uh, you, you can actually be able to use these colonies for the further downstream applications. So, this is the uh, transformations, uh, we have another method which is called as transductions where you are actually going to use the virus, right. So, it is a virus mediated process that allows the uptake of foreign DNA into the genome of both bacterial and the mammalian cells. It is a mechanism of horizontal gene transfer and can play a significant role in the evolution and the gene regulations. Bacteriophage transaction is a method of gene transfer in the bacteria that utilizes the bacteriophage to introduce the foreign DNA into the bacterial cells. This technique is valuable in gene cloning for several reasons including its availability to including its ability to transfer particular and efficient genetic material. You can have the uh, different types of bacteriophage uh, transactions, you can have the generalized transactions, you can have the specialized transactions. So, in the generalized transductions, uh, randomly incorporating bacterial DNA into a phage particle during the lytic cycle, it can be transfer any gene from the donor bacteria into a recipient bacteria. Whereas, in the specialized transductions occur when a temperate phase exercised incorrectly from the host genome carrying a specific bacterial gene adjacent to the uh, prophase, it transfers only the specific genes. What is the mechanism of the transform transductions? So, general mechanism. So, bacteriophage on infecting following the host lytic or the lysogenic life cycles. Then in the step 2 in the lysogenic life cycle, the bacteriophage genome gets incorporated into the bacterial DNA and remain dormant for several generations. After some time, when the phase genome gets excised from the host DNA, they occasionally take small sequences of the bacterial DNA with them, right. Fast genome containing uh, bacterial DNA are packed into a fast coat proteins into to form a complete virus or recombinant viral particles. When this FAS in infect a bacterial cell, the recombinant FAS genome containing bacterial DNA is introduced into the bacteria. The recipient bacteria is called as the transductions, which means the recipient bacteria is not going or uh, is now going to contain the efficient the uh, properties of the donor bacteria. 
what are the steps of the bacteriophage transduction? So, in the first is you are going to have the isolation of the phage and the host bacteria. So, choose an appropriate bacteriophage and the bacteria host strain for example, E. coli and phage P1 for the generalized transductions. Then the step 2 you are going to preparation of the donor DNA. So, in fact, the donor bacterial stain containing the gene of interest with the FAS allowing the FAS to replicate during which it actually accidentally packages the bacterial DNA into the new FAS particle. Then you are going to have the collection of the transducing phases. So, you can harvest the fast particle from the lysed donor bacteria. These particles now contain bacterial DNA fragments including the gene of interest. So, this is the general mechanism where uh, this is the going to be called as generalized transduction, this is going to be called as specialized transductions and, uh, and so on. Then in the fourth step, you are going to use that for infection of the recipient bacteria. So, in fact, the recipient bacteria strain with the transducing FAS, the FAS inject its donor DNA into the recipient cells. So, this is what exactly it is going to happen right. And then the step 5 there will be a recombination and the selection. So, the introduced DNA can recombine with the recipient's genome through homologous recombinations. Select for the recipient bacteria that have acquired the gene of interest often using the selectable markers such as antibiotic resistance. Now, what is the application of the transductions? So, application of the transduction is that it can be used for the gene mapping and the functional studies, it can be used for recreating the recombinant strains, it can be used for the genetic engineering and biotechnology and it can be used for the fast display technology. Now, the next step, uh, next uh, method of uh, DNA delivery is called as conjugations. So, conjugation transfer the genetic material from one bacteria to another through the cell to cell direct contact. The bacterial cell that uh, transfer its DNA is called as the donor cell and the one that receive it is called as the recipient cells. Conjugation, uh, conjugation is usually mediated by the F plasmid that carry a DNA sequence called the fertility factor or the F factor. The F factor produces a thin tube like structure which is called as filis through which the donor cell con con contacts the recipients. A nick is made in one of the strains of the double stranded F plasmid by an enzyme uh, relaxes into the donor cells and, and, this, and this strain is transferred to the recipient through to the filis. Inside donor recipient cells, the single standard DNA undergoes replication to form a double standard F plasmid identical to the original F plasmid. This process is mediated by a specialized structure which is called as filis. Conjugation play a significant role in spreading the genetic trait such as antibiotic resistance and the virulence factors among the bacterial populations. You can have the different types of conjugations, you can have the uh, F to F conjugations, you can have the HFR conjugations and you can have the H to F prime conjugations. In the F to F conjugation, this type of conjugation involves the transfer of the F plasmid from a F plus to a F minus DNA uh, recipient cells. The F plasmid carries genes that encode the sex filies and the other protein necessary for the conjugations. Then we have the HFR conjugations or high frequency uh, conjugations. So, it involves a high frequency recombination donor cells where the up plasmid has integrated into the bacterial chromosome. During the conjugations, the chromosomal DNA adjacent to the integrated F plasmids are transferred to the recipients. Transfer of the entire chromosome is rare because of the mating pair usually break apart before the process is complete. Then we have the F prime to the F uh, uh, conjugations. It occurs when the F plasmid excites from the bacterial chromosome taking some chromosomal gene. The F prime plasmid is then transferred to an F, F recipient introducing the chromosomal gene and the plasmid DNA. What is the mechanism of conjugation? So, mechanism of conjugation is very simple which is being mediated by the filis right. So, in the Step 1, there will be a formation of the pilis 
so, the donor bacteria which carries a conjugative plasmid such as F plasmid in the E. coli produces a sex pilis. So, this is the uh, this is the donor this is the donor uh, cell and this is the recipient right and uh, you have the F plasmid right. So, this F plasmid is actually going to introduce or will allow the formation of this bridge like structure right between the two bacteria and this bridge like structure is called as pilis and this one is the F plus cells these are the F minus cells this means these are the donor cells these are the recipient cells. The sex pilis is a thin flexible tube like structure that extend from the surface of the donor cells and attach to the recipient cells. Then you have the establishment of the mating pair the pilis retract bringing the donor recipient cell into the close contact a conjugative bridge or mating pore forms at the point of the contact allowing the transfer of the genetic material between the pilis. And then the third is there will be a plasmid transfer. So, once this is done there will be a rolling circle model right. So, it is going to start synthesizing the single strand of the plasmid and that will enter into the recipient cells. And the conjugative plasmid in the donor cell is nicked at a specific site which is called as the origin of transfer. One strand of the plasmid DNA is transferred onto the recipient cell to the cognitive conjugative bridge and the transfer is facilitated by the rolling circle replications where the remaining plasmid strand in the donor is used as a template for synthesizing the new complementary strand right. So, this will be keep circulating and keep going into this side and then the step 4 there will be a synthesis of the complementary strands. Once the single copy of this plasmid will enter into the recipient cells the recipient cell the single standard plasmid DNA serve as a template for synthesizing the complementary strand resulting in a double standard plasmids. Then the test type 5 you are going to have the separation of the two cells. Now, these two cells are going to get separated from each other and that is how this F plus cells has transferred its genetic material into the F minus cells and that is how the F minus cells is going to be converted into the F plus cells. So, after the transfer the conjugative cell bridge disassemble and the donor recipient cell separate both cells now contain the cognitive plasmid and now function as a donor in subsequent conjugation events. So, this means this cell has some special character which actually has been transferred onto the F minus cells and that is how the population of the F plus cells will keep growing into the into the bacterial cell populations. Now, the next uh, method of DNA delivery is called as micro injections. So, micro injection is a precise and versatile technique for the directly introducing a nucleic acid which is the DNA or the RNA and other substances into the cell. This method is uh, particularly useful in the gene cloning, genetic information, uh, genetic modification and the developmental biologies. The foreign DNA is directly inserted into nucleus of the host cells by a specialized automated uh, operator which is called as the micro injections. The steps involved into the micro injections, so you are going to have the preparation of the micro pipettes, then you are going to have the preparation of the cells. So, this is the step 1 you are going to have the preparation of the micro pipettes, then this is step 2 you are going to have the preparation of the a cell. Then step 3 you are going to have the preparation of the injection material. In the step 4 there will be a micro manipulations and the injections. Then in step 5 there will be a post injection care. The post injected cells are carefully transferred into a suitable growth or the incubation conditions for embryos or the OIC OCTs they may be cultured for the development further. Then the next step is called as the ballistic gun or ballistic method actually. So, the ballistic method or the particle bombardment or the gene gun technology is a physical method of DNA delivery into the cell. It involves propelling microscopic particle coated with the DNA onto the target cell or the tissue using the high velocity projectiles. This technique is widely used in the plant genetic injury, but can also be applied to the animal cells, fungi and bacteria. The ballistic method uses the high velocity particle to, DNA de to deliver the DNA into the cell. 
typically made up of, of gold or tungsten. These particles are coated with the DNA of interest and then accelerated towards the target cells. Upon impact, the DNA coated particles penetrate the cell wall and the membrane delivering the DNA into the cell's interior. What are the steps are involved into the ballistic method? The DNA, the delivery of interest is participated, the delivery, the DNA of interest is precipitated onto the surface of the gold or to the tungsten particle. So, you have actually a particle on which you are actually going to keep your DNA what you are going to transform, right. So, you are going to keep it, so you are going to coat this with the, that particular DNA. This is typically done by mixing the DNA solution with the particle in the presence of the calcium chloride and spermidine followed by washing and drying. The DNA coated particle onto are loaded onto a micro, macro carrier or placed onto the surface of a rupture disc within the gene, gene gun. The target cells or the tissue are prepared and placed in a gene gun chamber. The helium gas or a similar high pressure system accelerate the microcarriers or the rupture disc propelling the DNA coated particle toward the target cells. The particle penetrate the cell wall and a membrane de delivering the DNA into the cell. After bombardment, the cell or tissue are cultured under the appropriate condition to allow for the expression of the introduced gene. And then you also you can use the selection marker such as antibiotic disease gene often identifying the successfully transformed cells. So, this is all about what we have discussed about the DNA delivery into the host. So, for what we have discussed, we have discussed about the prokaryotic system, we have discussed about the transformations, uh, we have discussed about the, uh, how you can be able to prepare the competent cells and how you can be able to use the competent cells for the transformations of the bacteria. Apart from that, we have also uh, discussed about the yeast uh, transformations and we have also discussed how you can be able to prepare the competent cells into the yeast transformations and how you can be able to prepare, the, how you can be able to perform the transformation into the yeast. And apart from that, we have also discussed about the other mode of DNA delivery such as we have discussed about the uh, ballistic method, we have discussed about the micro injections, we have discussed about the conjugations and so on. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here, even subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more method of DNA delivery into the mammalian host and the other cells. Thank you.